I am Talia Minsberg, Assistant Sports Editor at the New York Times, and I am thrilled to be here with comedian and ultramarathoner Eddie Izzard. Eddie recently completed, very recently, right in time, in fact, 29 marathons in 29 days as part of his Make Humanity Great Again Challenge. He ran more than 745 miles in total and raised over $230,000 for the charity. It's no small feat and no laughing matter. And we're both very excited to kick off this discussion. Uh, but first a note about how questions will work. We will be taking questions live from listeners in about 20 minutes. So if you have a question you'd like to ask us, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. So if you're dialed in on the phone, you can hit star nine, that will raise your hand. If you are chosen to ask a question, you'll hear from us when you're, you are on deck. Once you're on the air, just please give us your name and where you are calling from. This event is being recorded and this is the only call. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so Eddie, thank you so much for being today. First, being with us today. First of all, where are you and how are you? What is your current situation? I'm in London. I'm okay. Um, of course, we're all dealing with COVID-19. Has everyone noticed how we were calling it coronavirus, but that seems to be too long, so we've now cut it down to COVID-19. I don't know if that's happened in America, but it seems or to even have happened COVID, here. Yeah. yeah, we just cut it down to this thing. But anyway, um, so yeah, we're in lockdown still, and... Um, that is, you know, some people are having a tougher time than others. Um, I'm doing okay with it. We're allowed out to exercise, which is good. Um, so, um, and also I've, I've, personally, I feel I've, uh, I've pushed myself really hard for about 10, 15, 20 years. Um, because initially I didn't have a career at all. Then I got a career and then I thought, well, to keep this career, let, let's not stay one step ahead of the of the pack or of the game or whatever I thought let's stay about four steps ahead so I've sort of tried to work myself very hard I have a very strong work ethic in order to stay ahead of your career disappearing down the toilet and uh, so to be honest having a bit of a rest here has not been too bad for me uh, in the sense of I just haven't rested for ages I don't do uh, holidays very much so um i'm yeah it's a bit too much of a rest but um yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a bit like an oil tech I, I feel i'm like an oil taker if i get going i'll just keep going but if i stop then it's very hard to get me started so I've, i'm i'm sort of halfway in between this stopping and starting thing so you know i i do want to get out and uh and, and train every day that i can well, you have an incredibly successful career and a lot of people know you for your comedy, but maybe some people don't know when you say you have done many things at once, you have run so many marathons and, and it was 2000, correct me if I'm wrong, it was 2009, 43 marathons in 51 days with only five weeks training. Then in 2016, 27 marathons in 27 days. And just at the beginning of this year, 29 marathons in 29 days. So how did you get started down that road? There's being busy and then there's doing one marathon a day for multiple days in a row. Yes, I, and I, you said five weeks training. It was actually six weeks training, which six does weeks. make does make the difference. That extra week obviously gets you the, the well, I don't know if that, yeah, it's it, apparently, I, I, you'll, you'll, you may know this if you're, um, uh, is it assistant sports editor, your, t your title yes. at New York Times? What is the length of time you should train for a marathon or is it different people say different things? Is different, there a yeah, different people say different things. It's definitely more than six weeks. Uh, I would say it's probably three to four months is probably the average. Right, three to four months. Well, yeah, because I thought if it'd be three to four months and you multiply that by 43, that means I'd have to be training for... Uh, what was that about uh, twelve years or something? And I just thought I'm I'm not going to do that. So, but but the thing I found, I mean, I got into it because um, there's a Sport Relief is a charity that's here and exists now, I believe, in America, um, where they try and encourage people who are not known to be sporty to do something that's a challenge and then people will go that person's going to do this thing that sounds crazy and then they might give more money uh slightly more money they or they might be more inclined to give money 
um, because they think yeah. this this that person won't do it. You know, whereas you know an Olympian, if they go and do something else, Olympian rower, if they go and do a running thing, you think, well, they they're just Olympian those kind of people. So anyway, I I, I sort of linked in on this, and I've always um, wanted to. Well, I made it an adventure for myself, which I think is something is a life thing, really. The only way to actually look at life is as an adventure because we all know we get as you know downs as well as ups sometimes more downs than ups but if you make it an adventure then that's built into the project so i made it an adventure it was to try and give me back the health but that's a little gift to myself of it was to give me back some of the health that i've had when i was a kid a lot of us when we're kids are runabout kids some of us aren't but some of us are kind of get up hey let's go do this let's go do that let's go and run over here run over there and you lose that in your teenage years going into your 20s a lot of people do and i thought well let's go and get that back and in the end you could raise money and do some good put some good into the world so i i i thought i i i know i thought i could do this it was a run the first one was a run around united kingdom 2009 and i just thought i might be able to run from one capital city london the capital of england say mm-hmm. to uh, cardiff the capital of wales which is that we have th- three countries and a province in the united kingdom so the capital of wales then the capital of northern ireland which would be belfast then the capital of scotland which would be edinburgh so i linked all these together and it took 43 marathons we didn't know how long it was going to be i was all over the place initially the first 10 marathons are a nightmare but i thought initially it would be about 70 percent um uh, mental and about 30% physical. I, I came up with this thing quite early on that it was probably more of a mental thing than, than a physical thing, even though the physical is important, but it's more the brain carrying on. And as, as time went on, I thought, no, it's 80% mental mm-hmm. and only 20%. And then when I got up to the leg district around about marathon 2022, 20, somewhere up there, I met some ultra marathon runners and I told them, and I said, well, what do you think it is? The, the percentage between mental and physical, um, the balance. And they said, oh, we have a joke. The uh, ultra marathon runners have a joke, which is the ultra marathon running or endurance running is 90, no, yeah, they said 90% mental and the other 10% is in your head. <laughs> so this is their joke, which is, you know, obviously meaning it's 100% mental. And I, I suddenly right. realized when they said it, it is, it's it, the brain will drag the body around um, and the body can be fit as a fiddle, but if your brain doesn't want to do it, you, you won't do it. it it's, the, it's the motivation. So this is the thing I learned out of it. And, um, and since then I've been able to do it again, but now I don't take days off. I used to take one day off a week and now I don't. And, um, I've, and I, and I always find the first 10 marathons are a nightmare. Well, not a nightmare, but just really rough. Uh-huh. Um, and then it gets better, but I've learned a lot of things on the way, like running in, in wet weather, get waterproof socks, waterproof socks. Mm. Cause if your feet start to get wet, they start to shred, um, wear shoes that are one size bigger than your normal foot size because your feet will expand when you run i didn't know that when i started um certain things i there's one place my feet pronate on um, the right, right foot uh, turns out slightly um so you have to get orthotics uh check that you need if you need orthotics if you're going to do things so so I, I i i got that and that saved me a whole load of pain which i was getting pains in my back because of it um and then i get because my right foot turns out i get a, a, a blister in one particular place and instead of if you know where you're going to get that blister tape up your foot before you run and then mm-hmm. you 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 won't get the blister so you you prevent the whole thing without creams without without blisters without combi blister plasters you, you just you can tape up your foot and then it won't be the skin won't be rubbing because it's it's taped and, and then you just untape it at the end of the run so that's there's a whole bunch of things i've learned and i've just become you know uh I know what I'm doing now. I'm experienced. Right. And so if you learned those physical tricks, what are the mental tricks? I assume you, on marathon one out of 51 marathons or marathon one out of 29 marathons, you can't really be thinking about how you're going to feel on day 28 or marathon 27. No, absolutely. Each marathon, just deal with that on its own. You can't really, you can't really have the idea in your head that you're going to fail, which is tricky when you first started off, you, you probably won't know if you can do these things. Um, um, on the last, on the 29 marathons, I was actually traveling, I was doing them in different cities in Europe. So I knew I had to travel at a certain time. I had a cutoff point to get on a plane, train, or a bus to get to the next city. And I had to do it by a certain time. And I, that's not how I did it before. I used to just run, and if it took a very long time, it took a long time. Whereas 
the pressure of, 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 of running to a specific time was, was much harder for me. Um, but I just, I'm not quite sure. I think I do, I probably do have a determination, genetic propensity mm -hmm. for determination. I think, you know, I've been trying to track this back into my school, uh, little stories from school when I was a kid that there's a, I came out with a biography. Um, uh, there was a biography, um, believe me, and you go through stories of your life and when you're looking through it, you know, coming up with a biography and mm -hmm. in certain things, if I was motivated, I could be, I could be very determined. And so maybe I'm more determined than some people. I think that's probably fair to say. I mean, coming out as transgender when I was 23, back in 1985, that you had to be pretty determined to go through that because back in 85, if anyone remembers uh, anything, transgender rights were not, you know, the whole transgender thing, it was not, it was kind of toxic at that time. We were not mm -hmm. cool. We were not considered cool. And in 90, it wasn't cool. 95, it wasn't cool. 2000, it wasn't cool. 2005, 2010. By 2014, there was a tipping point. A number of things happened, um, particularly in America, actually, between the transparency, um, transparent TV series and uh, Laverne, is it Laverne Cox? I think in the orange yes, and black, black activists, you know, front covers of magazines and then um, Caitlyn Jenner. Those three things as the tipping point, sort of world tipping point. And lucky it happened in America, really, because if it happened in another, if it happened in our country, it wouldn't have been so. The, the spill off wouldn't have been so worldwide. Anyway, okay. so, uh, but I, I haven't come out then. That that was a determination thing. That that is something I link back into. I thought I'm going to be up upfront about this, open about this. I could lose my career because my stand up career was taken off. And then there's a drama whole whole drama career. And, which, you know, because I'm an actor and a comedian, okay. and um, and all the films have been the, the ability to be able to. <laughs> I was running in girl mode in in the last. Uh, 29 marathons in the 27 marathons South Africa I was in boy mode just with nails painted and in the 43 marathons I was completely in boy mode but I've, I've still been out as been being transgender since you know for 35 years now so um, I try and make things hard for myself in a way and then see if I can do it. And can you tell us a bit about what it means uh, how gender plays into running for you in running as in boy mode and running in girl mode how do you decide how are those experiences different if at all? Well, I'm kind of based in, in, uh, in girl mode now. I'm sort of, I feel like I'm a trans woman, but I give myself permission to be in boy mode, like in the film I've got that was just about to come out before COVID-19 happened, uh, Six Minutes to Midnight with Judy Dench. And that's, obviously I'm playing a male role in that. And, and I, I do my stand-up though, I toured last year in girl mode. So mm -hmm. I, I have this, I'm gender fluid, I consider myself. I give myself permission to, to be like this. And if anyone has a problem with that, then they can talk to their psychiatrist and they can, the psychiatrist will calm them down. Whereas I'm okay with it. Uh, so it's, I can say that other people are having problems and it's their problems. But uh, as, as regards running, I just thought, well, you know, I, if I am, you know, based in girl mode pretty much now, then, then let's run in girl mode. I just hadn't, I hadn't thought it, it's, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. It's just, mm -hmm. um, and I still look the same way as I look, so which isn't terribly, um, you know, it's, it's kind of something more boy like. Well, it's a mix, some way between boy and girl life. And, and I, I use these terms, boy mode and girl mode. They're my terms, but rather than woman mode and man mode, which just seem very heavy duty. And we're all born, you know, we're all fetuses are girls, as you'll probably know, until some get coded boys. So we get obsessed about the differences in, uh, in, in our sexes or our sexuality but you know mother nature just says no i need you guys to procreate so i'm going to code some of you boys and some of you girls x x x y i'm going to mix up the chromosomes i'm going to do this don't get too head up about it but we said no we're going to get head up about it mm -hmm. uh, and i'm not so so for me it was just i wanted to yeah well i'm, I'm trying you know make the humanity great again i i there's another slogan out there somewhere which i think someone else uses that's a bit similar to that but my thing is let's head towards the 2030s right rather than going back to the 1930s and i think all the right-wing politicians of the world are saying no the 1930s where people used to lie left right and center make stuff up and hate everyone let's go back to that and i'm saying no nope, 2030s is where we're going so i wanted to run in in girl mode and i wanted to do this thing and um and hopefully other people out there will say, well, that's a positive thing rather than a negative thing. 
And you did these 29 marathons right before things started changing with COVID, correct? You finished pretty recently. Yes. yes. I mean, it was, if we'd started in March, it would have all, it would have all folded under. Um, it was linked to the, we, we have a, uh, a Brexit situation that's uh, going on in, in mm-hmm. our country. Well, it, it's something that, it, you know, states' rights. It's basically your states' rights situation in America. The argument between whether we're working together to move forward as a, as, um, in, in Europe or whether we're all going to separate and go back to the 1930s. This again, this is, I come back to that. So, um, that all, there was a tipping point. There was a, there was a date that was the end of January. So I started running on the, at the end of January into okay. February. So February was my month, 28 days normally in, in February. It would happen to be a leap year. So I threw in an extra marathon. Uh, I started in, in London and I finished in London to make it a, a 29, uh, 29 marathons in the month of February. But that's why that happened. But yeah, but if we'd started in March, it would have all just gone away. So you have to have a bit of luck. I'm yeah, yeah. Ahead. I feel like there are very few people in the world who could say the sentence, I just threw in an extra marathon. That's a pretty oh, incredible. The, the, that is an interesting thing. Um, it, it's, it's like in, in South Africa, I finished with a double marathon, which now my day five was in, um, I, I tried to run in South Africa. It, the 27 marathons was in 27 days as a salute to Nelson Mandela, 27 mm-hmm. years in prison, and all the anti-apartheid guys and what they've done to fight to get to it. I never did enough when I was a, a, a teenager, uh, young adult, so I thought, I can do this. This is my salute to Nelson Mandela. And I tried in 20, 2012, and I failed. I got rhabdomyolysis, which is a horrible thing where you, your muscles shred into your bloodstream and your clogs up and then you... I think that your kidneys give up. It's very dangerous, um, then, yeah. Yes, then you die. And death is not good for running. Um, and so I, 2016, I managed to get back and we, and we worked out what was going wrong. Um, and, uh, but still day five, there's something about my kidneys. My, my sports doctor, Dr. Gary, was, was saying, you got to check this out. So day five, I was again stopped. Last time I, I stopped the whole thing on day five. And this time we had to just, put a pin in it and just hold at day five. This was back in 2016. And then he said, okay, you, day six, you can start again and do your fifth marathon. And so we, we ended up being a marathon behind. And there was an idea of, of cutting the marathon up into little chunks and spreading it over the rest of the time. But I thought, no, let's just, let's just do a double marathon at the end because you're trying to encourage people to give money and mm-hmm. it makes one hell of a climax. And so I, on the last day, on the 27th day, I ran Marathon 26 and then went straight into Marathon 27, back to back. And that was 56 miles, which 84 Oof. kilometers, um, all in one go. And it's very weird. If you got used to running marathons and then you just trip into your second marathon straight off, um, it was honest. I knew I couldn't think about it because I just, I was right. counting down from 90K. Um, and... Uh, yeah, that, but it, it is weird. You can, what I think I proved actually is that we can all do more than we think we can do. And I think mm-hmm. World War II proves this. Now, if you, if you forget about the, the brainwashed people of the Axis groups, the people saying, you know, like in Japan, I will die for the emperor and then in Germany, I will die for Hitler and in Italy. Well, we don't really, really want to die. Um, but if you take the rest of us, people were volunteering, they were going, but they were going beyond the call of duty in democratic countries saying, we need to fight this thing. And they did stuff that they probably when they were younger, didn't think they would do, or even up to the mm-hmm. date of the war breaking out, didn't think they were going to do. So I think we can all, we have this capacity to do more than we think we can do. And, and, and hopefully let's do it for a good reason, because unfortunately, if you take, you know, the, the, if you take all the the, the the fascist side in the Second World War, there, there was a number of people doing things that were kind of beyond the call of duty, and they were doing it for bad reasons. They were saying, "Yes, Hitler, I'm sure he's right. He's, he must have worked with that." But no, he hadn't. He was an insane bastard. I don't know if I can say that word, but uh, there you go. And uh, so that was the wrong thing to do. So I'm, you know, I'm everything I'm doing is trying to encourage people, younger people growing up. Mm-hmm. People who are young and young at heart to go. Yeah. Uh, so even if you're 90, you're so young at heart. Or this, this we have a, a doctor, a uh, doctor, uh, um, a captain Tom here, who uh, who's now who's now Colonel Tom, who's a hundred year old, and he decided to do a um, walk, walk with his Zimmer frame and raise money 
and he's he's raised now 16 million and it's, it's sort of caught fire in, in Britain. So we can all do more than we think we can do. That I think I proved and, and, I, and if, I, if I encourage other people to do good things, I think that's kind of, that's good, that's wonderful. Absolutely, and I think that segues well into the last question I'll ask before we open it up for questions, which is, what kinds of things have you learned through all these ultra marathons? I mean, it's, it's all about endurance of body and mind, which I think a lot of people are trying to work on right now. We don't know what the next few weeks, months are going to look like. So what kinds of things have you learned in ultra running that you think that you would advise people to do as they deal with the endurance of this dealing with this new world? Ah, that's, that's interesting. Comparing that to this. Um, well, it, it it will get better. Mm -hmm. This is this is looking actually. I mean, there's a there's an LGBT site. There's it gets better dot com. So that's that's when you're in a hellish situation and when you're first coming out, and then things do get better. So it links back to that. But but we, you know, I think we've uh, probably you've been in, in in lockdown about as long as us, or a bit maybe a bit less, but similarish time. Or everyone mm -hmm. now similarish time, and it's. Um, we can get used to this, uh, but but there will be light at the end of the time. We will come out of this, but we have to just stay the time on, 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 you know, we have to just stay in there. Otherwise we get second, you know, surges and third surges where, you know, the, the number crunches have worked this out. If we all go back in and say, ah, we don't want to do this, uh, this whole movement to say, no, like, it's nothing, let's go back in. Um, it, it's, it's not going to be, that's not going to be a good news for any country that does that. Um, but, um, I'm not sure if they if they totally link together, but I do know that motivation is the thing. I was I was trying to do a really difficult thing in yeah. the running, that, but uh, and be positive about it, and it was helping raise money, and it was doing something to me, and it was an adventure. Whereas the the lockdown is a trickier thing, I think, because it's it's you're it's a different kind of, of endurance. Adventure. Yes, it's it's not much of an adventure. I mean, you have to maybe learn things from from in this moment of lockdown. We have to we have to get on, you know, watch documentaries, watch stuff, and, and maybe get our minds into a different place. But it's it's tricky. You know, some people have families pushed together. Some people uh, are running out of money. There's a whole lot of trickier situations. But um, uh, it it w we will come out of this. Yeah. But they, people just have to stay the course on that. Um, Whereas the, if you're ever doing any endurance thing you're doing, um, if you decide you want to do it, it will get done. It, it, it's you deciding. It's like people say, I can't run a marathon. And I can prove that they, anyone can run a marathon. Agreed. And this was, uh, and I say this by saying, um, imagine, uh, forget COVID-19, but just say a, a terror situation happened in any city or town and, and no one was allowed to, there were no trains, buses, whatever, and but you cars or anything. But they said this medicine. You need emergency medicine for a loved one in your family, and it's 13 miles away, and it's 21k away. And you would get there, and you may you run, walk, crawl, stagger to that mm -hmm. place to get the medicine and get it back. You do that because you were motivated, and uh, so we can all do these things if we set up a motivation. I can set up uh, emergency motivation. Uh, um, when I want to, if, if I choose to, that's the weird thing. And that's from coming out as being transgender at 23, because mm -hmm. I didn't need to come out at that point. I'm a straight transgender, you know, I'm a wannabe lesbian. So um, I could have just lied like many people have their entire lives and not said anything and just, you know, but I thought, no, let's get the conversation going. Let's get the dialogue going. Let's come out and, and, and see where the chips lie, you know, just get, get it out in the open. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. Let's, keep the conversation going and open it up for questions. Uh, first up, we have Jeremy. So we'll unmute you and then we'd love to hear your question. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Jeremy. I'm from uh, San Diego. And uh, thanks for doing this, Eddie. I just wanted to know uh, when you are running your marathons or when you're training, uh, I'm just wondering what kind of things you tend to think about if there's any sort of trend. Thanks. That is an interesting thing. Um, um, on my initial two um uh marathon month, the, the 43 and the 27 in south africa 43 was in the uk i didn't listen to anything um particularly in the uk i was um on roads and i never had security with me so i used to just sort of run and they used to i used to meet them 10 miles ahead and so i had to listen out for traffic so there was actually a danger the, the, or a safety thing that i i, I didn't uh, 
I didn't listen to any uh, things on my headphones. So uh, I, so the things I was thinking of, it's interesting. What was I thinking about? Um, I am a quite an inquisitive, inquisitive person. Yeah, inquisitive person. I'm, I, I find knowledge fascinating. So and, and in my standup, I have to talk about things. So I just, I, I would use the space. If the Vista was fantastic, like in the Lake District, which is the Northwest of our country, of the United Kingdom, it's very um, glacial. It was built, you know, this huge, uh, well, comparatively huge uh, mountainettes or big hills and, and valleys and, and, it's, and big lakes. And, and, it, and it looks um, kind of stunning. Because when I say big, I compare it to America, it's not so big. But, mm -hmm. um, um i would use that and 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 sometimes i, I remember running through the the it said the battle of naseby is up here battle of naseby is one of our famous civil war battles we had a civil war too and uh that was one of the key battles and i was thinking i was running along this is where cannon would have been going along and the and the the, the, the cavalry would have been coming up here and for the for the roundheads and the cavaliers for the the king's forces and for the parliamentary forces and, and i got into that so i would use anything to to get my mind thinking about things but sometimes i would run out of things and um and on the last uh so i have i didn't listen to music in south africa or in, in or, or, or audiobooks, but I did do audiobooks when I was doing it uh, in, on the 29 because I had to speed up and i had to get my mind off the how my legs were hurting so i I do listen to uh, loads of audio books on, on, on uh, things, ancient, your American Civil War. I know a lot about that, so I've listened to the Battle of Vicksburg in particular. General Grant, who I'm, I'm very in, intrigued by, because um, he was just a determined bastard, Grant, and he just kept going. And, um, and uh, so I, I will take in a lot of information that way. So audio books, um, stories like that, but, but all, all things and everything was, was what was good for my head. And also, if you run with a friend uh, or someone, anyone or someone you don't know, if they come along, that will take your mind off things. And then you go, oh my God, mm -hmm. we've just done 5K. So that's a very handy thing. Now, with the modern headphones that you can stick in your ears, your ear pods, um, you can actually just call up a friend. If, you, if you're getting into a tough bit when you're running, if you're doing something ultra marathon, call a friend up and have a chat with them. Because I found that's the same thing as running with a friend. You can just talk to them on the on your earphone. So I would say use whatever you need to get yourself to do it. But I always kept my motivation locked in that this thing would get done. And, um, and on this last one, the 29 one, it had to be done by a certain time. So I just had to keep moving. And sometimes it was very tough. It's a great question. Thank you so much. And we will move next to Max. Hi, um, I'm calling from Copenhagen. Uh, thanks very much for uh, for making yourself available. My question actually was similar to to Jeremy's uh, about uh, what you think about, but maybe to to move it along the lines of um, do you do you ever experience? Because I'm I'm a big fan of your comedy, and I love how you jump from topic to topic, and you seem to be racing three steps ahead of uh, of, of the of the zeitgeist or the, or the audience sometimes. And I wonder if you ever uh, experienced periods of slowing down that thinking or periods of stillness or if running becomes a meditation for you or if it's primarily this way of also um, continuing to soak in inspiration and, and uh, thoughts about the world. Yes, um, that's a good question. Um, uh, yes, yeah, sometimes it does become meditative um, and it, it needs to be when you feel on top of it. If you, if you go to yediazel.com, my website, um, you'll see the marathons. There is uh, the list for the, the South African marathons and uh, the more recent uh, European marathons. And the South African ones, if there's, um, what is it? It's about marathon six or seven or eight. There's a point. Well, actually, I, I think it's the Invictus poem. If you watch the, there's a special video in there for the Invictus poem, which meant a lot to Nelson Mandela. And at the end of that, um, I, I was running, the sun was going down. I had already done a marathon and I'd done an extra third of a marathon to catch up on because one day I'd only done two thirds of a marathon. So, and, and the, the wind was in my face. The sun was going down. It just looked amazing. And, I, and we were kind of high up so we could look out over South Africa spread in front of us. And I remember thinking, this is, and I said it, I said it to the camera, this is amazing. This is inspiring. So sometimes things really do inspire you and, and just get you to a, 
a wonderful place and you don't need to think about anything because you can just say, look, you can just look out with your eyes. Now, uh, Highland Zebra National Park, Highland Zebra National Park, I, I, it was a national park I ran in. And that was an amazing day in South Africa where it was, it was um, just, one, we're running past zebras and they said, watch out, because we're worried about lions. Are the lions going to eat us? No, don't worry, the lions have eaten, they're fine. Uh, the buffalo could do you that. The buffalo, because I didn't know buffalo were really dangerous, but they're really dangerous. <laughs> and so they said, stay close to the, to the car, because you might have to jump in if the buffalo come along. So, but it was just, it was a wonderful time to be actually running through a national park, which you, who, who gets the chance to do that? But on the end day, on the double marathon, it was, that was, I was running for 11 hours and 50 minutes. And I, um, and that was all pain. That was, if not, not, no, no pain, it's just, uh, what's the best word for it? It was just, just endless. I didn't feel good except for five minutes out of that whole time. There was a five minute period of elation where I thought, hey, I think I can do this when I had 30K to go. And then it all got a bit tough. So, um, so yeah, I, sometimes you do just get, as I said, the Lake District, the, um, in some places in South Africa, running around uh, uh, um, Robben Island when Nelson Mandela had been 18 years, spent 18 years of his 27 years. And that was amazing. And they, they let me lie down in his, in his cell. And um, so it's just, it was, yes, it, it can be amazingly um, zen-like and, and open-like, but you, usually, you have to get through these first 10. The first 10 are the tough buggers. And then I love that easy. piece of advice. Get through the first 10 marathons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know it sounds silly, but it seems to be true. That's great. Thanks, Max. Uh, next up, we have Christina. It would be great to hear your question. And Christina, can you hear us? You, you should get a little oh, cue that lets you unmute. Oh, oh good. sorry. Okay, hi. hi. This is Chris. Hi, um, thank you. Thank you for doing this. I'm calling from Manhattan. Um, uh, my first question was asked by the first two callers. The second is, how do you keep your whole body in in shape and condition to do this over and over and over again? One of the things I've been doing during lockdown when I can't run as much outside is trying to do other kinds of complementary fitness. And I'm just wondering, how do you think about that? How do you take care of yourself, not just your soul, but your body to do these things in the long, the long haul? So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, uh, Christina. Um, yeah, that's, it's a very good question because I want to do more of these. And um, I'm trying to, I'm experimenting with what I need to do to keep this body, because I'm 58 now, um, doing whatever I want it to do as time goes on. I think I'm a little lucky because I stopped competitive sports when I was 12. I went to a school that didn't play football, soccer, that, that I, which was my beloved sport. And so I didn't really play much sport in, in my teenage years when the bones were all moving. And uh, there's a, something about humans is that if we have good sports people, they, they, we take them in their, in their teenage years and say, now we're gonna train you extremely hard as the bones are, are growing and moving which is not maybe the best idea health-wise in the long term, because no tiger does this. No one, ever, no one ever says, hey, Steve, you're an excellent tiger. We think you're gonna be one of the best hunters in the, in the tiger tribe. Um, so we're gonna do some big exercises on you. So um, they, they just all grow um, ergonomic, I don't know if ergonomic is the right word, but they, they just grow in a natural way. But I'm, at the moment I'm experimenting with doing, trying to do a marathon a month and then 30K, then, and, and every week I will do 30K, 20K, 10K, then 42K. Uh, I'm talking in, in kilometers here rather than miles. Um, I know you've got miles, but it's, so, it's easier in K just because you know, it tends to go 10, 20, 30, 40, even though it's 10.5, 21, you know. Uh, I just find the numbers easier. And uh, so I'm, I'm just go I'm going to, I want to keep this body fit because you, all wild animals are fit all of their lives and then they die. So they, they just stay fit. I met an 80 year old lion in Boston Zoo. People from Boston Zoo very, very nicely said, hey, do you want to have a see around Boston Zoo? And I met this 80 year old lion and he tried to kill us, which is what lions do, you know. And we, we were behind the bars, it was fine. But he came in and he could smell us apparently. So he was pouring at the door and then they let him in and he came in and he sort of did a mock attack on us. 
And we all went, whoa. And I just thought, what 80 year old man would, or woman would come into a place and say, come on, then I'll have you all. And I just thought, I'd quite like to be as feisty as an 80 year old lion when I'm an 80 year old person. So um, I'm, I'm experimenting with, with, uh, with what I do, but I, I never, uh, there's, there's something key that I seem to have had from my 12 year old youth, which is I, I never, you know, uh, I'm always on my toes. I always run on my toes, even though it's long distance. Sprinting, you tend to run on your toes, but um, I, I, my heels don't hit. So my knees, even though my knees are a little bit achy, they don't, they're not as bad as, you know, a lot of people say, oh, the knees went, the knees went when I was 30, 40, or whatever. I'm 58 now, the knees are still there. And I heal quite quickly. I think I'm 2.6% I'm Neanderthal. So I think my Neanderthal genetics help me. So try and be Neanderthal if you can. <laughs> <laughs> Helpful advice for us all. Uh, thank yeah. you so much. And next up we have Siami, and I do apologize if I mispronounced your name there, but. It's all right. It's a Yami actually. I'm calling from Los Angeles. And hi, hi, my question is, when you realized the serious of the COVID-19, what were your concerns about your own health, considering you had just traveled through 28 countries in 28 days, uh, seemingly using uh, public transportation most of the time, and you likely had a compromised immunity system from the constant running? Well, I could have had a compromised immunity system or even a, a, a boosted immunity system because I was in such a healthy space. So, I mean, this thing was coming up as we were going. And um, yeah, I didn't really know quite, you know, because, you know, the, the last big, I mean, there's been the SARS outbreak. I, I know it's happened not that long ago, but that wasn't in the United Kingdom. Um, I, in my lifetime, I haven't uh, been through one of these. So I, uh, when we were traveling around, a very s s small support team, there was two of us or three of us, um, and uh, yeah, we just tried to be sensible, keep distance. We were trying to do social distancing. Uh, we were trying not to, you know, touching hands, eyes, face, and that kind of thing. But it was, it, at the beginning of the month, nothing was really worried about. You know, it just got serious and serious. So by the end of the month, um, you were thinking, well, I'm glad this is, this is coming to an end. But we, we just did the social distancing and we did whatever we could that was logical to do. Uh, and we tried to keep our carbon footprint down doing buses as much and trains as much as we can, as we could. And um, yeah, but I, I'm not sure whether my, my immune, uh, um, whether my, 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 my system was, was stronger from running this. I felt that it was strong because I was in a fitter space. And, and my speed was getting stronger. That, this is the fact, your, your speed and your ability to do things, it gets stronger as time goes on. So you actually get stronger as you do this rather than weaker. You think you get weaker, and you get stronger. So I thought well, I was in a pretty good place to uh, hopefully uh, get through things. Because, you know, fit, I, I believe fit, if you're fitter, you will have a stronger immune um, uh, immunity ability. I'm losing the word of what it is. is it immune defense? Yeah, anyway. That's what I think. If that vaguely answers your question. Yeah, thank <laughs> you so much. Uh, next up, we have Emily. We'd love to hear your question. Hi, Emily. Hello, hello. Uh, I'm did, oh, sorry, did I get it? Yes, right, we can Emily? hear you now. I'm so sorry. It's all right. Um, I'm Emily from Texas. And my question is, how did it differ not having that big crew? I mean, with safety and traffic and your travel, I've watched the 2009 and the 2016. And that was my big question is like, how to, with the safety and the traffic, and then maybe in some points, it was like, what are the pros and cons? That's what I'm asking. What are the pros okay, and cons? Well Mm -hmm. Well, the truth is, if um, it's a little difficult to see because when the camera is on me, you, you don't really see what's behind me. But 2016 uh, and 2012 in South Africa, we were advised that security was important. I couldn't tell how important it was, but you couldn't really argue with the experts on, on the ground. Um, when we were out in Eastern Cape, all the locals seemed very nice to me. You know, I, I you know, obviously um, most of the people, you know, 99% of the people are going to be really nice to them. Somebody's going to be a, a a card, you know, 
a car hijacker or you know uh, stuff you stuff you in the boot of a car so uh so that was i had to get used to that one and that was they were always about 10 to 20 uh, meters slash yards behind me um i got used to that but i preferred one in in the uk they were as i mentioned before they were usually 10 miles ahead or 10 miles behind me i'd say don't worry about me and people would come up to me and say don't you have a support you know don't you have security particularly security i'd say yes the security people they're all in the trees they're in the trees they're up there at the moment because i just i was i quite like this this being i was out there running because you know when i'm training i just run on my own and uh and I'm not worried about it. And and so when I was running in the different cities, I was uh, I was generally on my own, or I was with my my uh, sports therapist would, would come with me, or Sarah Johnson, my uh, uh, road manager, she'd come out on a bicycle because she her knees are not so great. Um, so I would either have someone with me or not with me, but I was never worried. I'm maybe one should be worried, but I I just don't. You know, I'm a transgender person who's out, and I refuse to travel with fear i just i give off non i give off you know <laughs> don't hassle me vibes or just you know i'm going to be more hassle than it's worth vibes if you, if you if you get in my face but anyway i didn't actually did i meet anyone i don't think i have really met anyone who was ever going to give me grief and also if people are going to give you grief it's, it's probably if you're walking along but if you're running along you, you've gone you know before they, they decide that they're going to give you a hard time you're you're away so um so it was all good and i kind of prefer going out and, and just running on my own actually i don't mind i don't know if people are with me especially towards the towards the end of the marathons i it was nice to have someone join me because then i would chat about things and we would chat about everything you know because you can and that's the beautiful thing and i am interested in everything so um so uh yeah so i'm not worried about not having security around. Excellent. Thank you. And I think this may be our last question. We have Henry. Hi, Hi Henry. Hi, Eddie. Uh, I'm calling in from a little town called Walla Walla in Washington State. And my question is, over all of these years and the different, uh, you know, efforts you've taken on in this regard, is there one or two really profound lessons about diet and nutrition that you've taken mm -hmm. away and things that you've edited about your own food consumption to help you sustain this kind of work? Yes, I'll go into two bits of this. The first one, I, I think there was a change in world, uh, uh, in the world experts on, on what, uh, what you should be having of, of uh, that, that high car carbohydrate was, was necessary for, for running. Um, and that was when I was doing the 2009. So I was experimenting with trying to have high carbohydrate. I remember I sat down one night and said, well, potatoes are carbohydrate and I like potatoes. So I'm gonna eat a whole bowl of potatoes tonight, you know, literally about 10 potatoes. And I couldn't hardly stand at the end of that. So uh, that was not a good idea. Um, but then when I ran in 2012, going into 2016 in South Africa, it was high fat, low carb, rather than high carb, low fat, high fat, low carb, going back to the old thing, butter was back, you know, eating skin on chicken. You know, and this kind of thing. And so um, I went into that kind of uh, um, uh, diet and I looked much better for it because I didn't really lose any weight in, on, on the UK. I did want to see if, if it would slim me down because I'm, I'm kind of an obsessional person. I can get things done because I'm obsessional, but I will also eat rubbish because I'm obsessional. So um, that was part of my experimentation thing. So high fat, low carb is what I have locked in. And right now I'm, um, uh, I'm at the point of, of wanting to try the, the thing where you, you, you take a number of things out of, your, uh, out of your diet and then add them back in one at one to, tell, to work out which the things you, you have an allergy to. Because I think there's probably something that it, certain things are worse for me than others. Anything I like, anything that I like the taste of is probably bad for me. And I, I'm a complete sugarholic. So, um, uh, you know, the alcoholics, and there's a lot more, there's a lot of holics that are, have things that are very, very dangerous for them, but sugar holic doesn't seem that, they, but, but, you know, I, if I start eating sugar, then I want more sugar, then I want more sugar. And the less sugar I eat, the less I want. So um, I am trying to experiment to get a training and an eating regime for the rest of my life that will, that will keep me ticking over and happy to look in the mirror and, 
happy with with my body and i should do more bending and uh, and um and uh and and stretching and and, and stuff because i'm not very supple i do have this kind of bullet uh like rock like thing where I, I can get things done but i'm i'm not hugely bendy um and i, sh I should be more but but I've never quite got to the bottom of that one. Well, thank you so much. That was a great question, Henry. And unfortunately, it is time for us to sign off. We thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope whether you were running alongside with us and hey, you can, this is something you can listen to. First, someone who asked, you know, Eddie, what do you listen to? Now you have an Eddie podcast. Uh, and, or if you were just sitting and listening in place, we really do hope you enjoyed the conversation. A huge thanks to Eddie for joining us. Uh, this Thank event, you very much. Yeah. This event is a part of a series of events at the Times that we produce to help readers understand and navigate the world we find ourselves in today. So next up on Sunday, tomorrow at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, Simon, a uh, series moderator of The Stone and New York Times opinion editor, Peter, will speak with us with guest Todd May, philosopher and advisor on the TV show, The Good Place about our ethical obligations during and before our current crisis. And you can see a full slate of digital events and RSVP at timesevent.nytimes.com. Big thank you to our subscribers as always. You make our work possible. Thanks again to Eddie and we look forward to speaking with you and hearing from you all again soon. Thanks very much.